Before we get too far into the reproductive system, we should take a little time to discuss the topics of sex and gender. Humans reproduce by sexual reproduction. We have a gamete from a male that has to join with a gamete from a female to produce the offspring. So we have different sexes in humans. A person's sex refers to their physical and physiological characteristics, what uh, uh, hormones and structures are physically present in their body. This is typically but not always going to be determined by the chromosomes that are present in an individual. In humans, we typically think of two sexes. We do have male and female, but it's also possible to be intersex, where we don't quite have a complete uh, male or female system, but rather kind of something in the middle. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. As I mentioned, the sex is typically determined by the presence of the chromosomes. We have a pair of sex chromosomes in humans. There is a Y chromosome and an X chromosome, and depending on the combination you have, that's considered either female or male. A person who has two X chromosomes is considered female, whereas a person with one X and one Y is considered male. While most people are either XX or XY, there are some variations that can occur. There are some individuals who may have an X chromosome, but no Y. And there could be individuals who have uh, two X chromosomes plus a Y, or an X chromosome with two Ys. Regardless of the different variations, when it comes to determining one's sex by chromosomes, we look for the presence of the Y chromosome. If an individual has at least one Y chromosome, they are considered to be male. If a person does not have a Y chromosome, they are considered to be female. That comes down to the importance of the Y chromosome in really determining the development of male structures and male physiology. Let's take a little bit closer look at what happens during sex determination, how the chromosomes that are present determine whether male or female structures are going to form. During embryonic development, an embryo develops two sets of ducts. Regardless of what its chromosomes are and whether this is going to be a male or a female, two sets of ducts form. One of those sets of ducts has the potential to become the female reproductive structures, and the other set of ducts has the potential to become the male reproductive structures. At this point, we're looking at about six weeks old. So when the embryo is only about six weeks along, at this point, we have two sets of ducts, could go male, could go female, and the gonads themselves, the tissues that will become either testes or ovaries, are also undifferentiated between those two. They still could go either way. So by about six weeks into embryonic development, the embryo has the potential to either develop as a male physiologically or develop as a female. If the embryo has two X chromosomes, no Y chromosomes, then the ducts that would form the male reproductive structures will degenerate or degrade on their own. They don't have the hormones they need to stay present, so they just sort of degenerate. The ducts that remain will form female reproductive structures like the uterus and the uterine tube. The gonads will become ovaries and the external genitalia forms the vulva, or the female external genitalia. We typically consider the development of female reproductive structures to be the default. If nothing happens, if nothing happens to change it, the ordinary course of development would make things uh, into the female structures. However, if a Y chromosome is present, something different happens. There's an important gene on the Y chromosome called the SRY gene that controls a lot of other genes. And when the SRY gene is transcribed, when we make that protein, it controls the production of a lot of other proteins in the cells of a male embryo. One of the most important functions of these genes controlled by the SRY is to cause the gonads to become testes. And once that tissue that's gonna be the gonads becomes testes, the testes produce two important things. One of those is testosterone, and the other is a hormone that results in the degradation of the ducts that would become the female reproductive structures. 
So we lose the ducts that would become the female structures. We have testosterone that then stimulates the ducts that would become the male structures to form things like the ductus deferens, the epididymis, and the other male reproductive structures. The testosterone also stimulates the development of male external genitalia so that we see a penis and a scrotum form rather than a vulva. Most of the time, everything works pretty much as planned and individuals with two X's will develop female genitalia and female reproductive structures and individuals with an X and a Y will develop the male reproductive structures and the male genitalia. However, there are a few places where the system can go a little bit awry and we see something different happen. For example, if an embryo with XX chromosomes is exposed to too much testosterone or other androgens, which is a similar type of hormone, then they can actually develop male reproductive structures even though they don't have the Y chromosome. So then you would have an XX individual that could have a penis and a scrotum and perhaps even in some of the duct system that's present in the male reproductive system. It's also possible to go the other way. You can have XY embryos that either don't produce enough testosterone for some reason or produce plenty of testosterone but don't have the appropriate testosterone receptors and in that case even with the XY chromosomes the individual would develop female reproductive structures and female external genitalia. So we can really consider a person's sex at different levels. We can consider their chromosomal sex, whether they have two X's or an XY or some other combination of sex chromosomes. We can consider their gonadal sex, whether they produced testes or they produced ovaries. And we can also consider um, whether they have the other reproductive structures, whether they have male or female external genitalia. When these different levels of sex determination don't match up or when we have an individual who may have characteristics that are in between male and female, that's where we have individuals who are considered to be intersex. While the terms sex and gender were used interchangeably for a long time, we now see them as two separate concepts. Sex is based on those characteristics that we just talked about, the presence of the chromosomes, the gonads, and the genitalia. Physical and physiological characteristics and we label those as male or female or intersex. Gender is a little bit more complicated of a concept. It's really more related to how the sexes interact with each other and the greater world around them. As far as concepts of masculinity and femininity, difference in roles, difference in behaviors, and other social factors. When we're discussing sex, we use the terms male, female, and intersex. When we're discussing gender, we tend to use the terms um, man or woman or boy or girl, and it's also possible, like we have intersex individuals, not quite male, not quite female, we do have uh, other variations in gender as well. Individuals who don't really identify as being man or woman, boy or girl, are often referred to as non-binary, meaning they don't fit into either of those categories. They may consider themselves to be a combination of both genders or not either gender, and this is sometimes also referred to as being genderqueer. A person's gender is usually assigned at birth uh, when their sex is. If a baby is born who is female, they're usually referred to as a girl, whereas a um, baby who's born as a male is referred to as a boy. However, a lot of one's gender is wrapped up in one's perception of themselves and how they fit into society and which gender role they feel most comfortable with. Because of that, we do have individuals who are assigned to sex when they're born, but their gender doesn't match that assigned sex. We call those individuals transgender. For example, if a baby is born with male genitalia and they're assigned the male sex, they may also be considered to be a boy, and that person instead considers themselves to be a girl, they would be transgender. Their gender identity, how they feel about themselves, does not match their sex. Individuals whose gender identity does match their sex are considered cis. So if a baby is born and they're assigned female for their sex, and then they grow up as a girl and consider themselves a girl, they would be considered cisgender. Where this topic becomes important to people who are working in the medical field is when it comes to treating transgender individuals. 
A transgender man is a person who was assigned female at birth, but considers themselves a man and takes on that role in society. This person may prefer to be referred to with he, him pronouns and treated like a man. However, because they do have two X chromosomes, they may still have some of the female reproductive structures. And it's important in a medical setting to be able to treat the person with respect as the person they are, meaning treating them as a man, but you also have to be able to consider the organs and structures that are present in their body that may need to be considered. So it's possible that you would have a transgender man who would still need to have a pap smear or a breast exam if those um, tissues and organs are present in their body. On the other hand, you may have a transgender woman a woman that we refer to as she or her, and they, because they do have XY chromosomes, may have a prostate, in which case uh, a prostate exam may be important for that individual. Recent research has shown that trans individuals often are not given very good clinical care or they won't seek clinical care because of their concerns about the differences between their biological sex and their gender. The recommendation now is that intake forms should include both a spot for sex and also a spot for gender. That allows people in the medical setting to treat the person appropriately according to their gender while also knowing what anatomy may be present in needing medical attention.